Answer correctly, um, and she'll tell us about technical lessons learned from Pythonic refactoring. Hello there. I guess we came across the first uh, problem with naming. Uh, my name is pretty hard to pronounce. So let's get started. My name is Yanni Cheng, and I work for Yelp. I'm a software engineer from Hamburg. And today we're going to talk about technical les uh, lessons learned from Pythonic refactoring. So a note about Yelp. So what do we do? We connect um, people with great local businesses. So say you're new to Karlsruhe, and then you pull up the Yelp app. You can find the greatest, greatest restaurant with the best reviews. And if you're at home figuring out a pummeling problem, you can take a picture and then send it um, to Yelp to request a quote so that businesses will reply within a short period of time to tell you how much it will cost to fix your plumbing problem. So this is what Yelp does. Um, in Europe, we have two offices in London and in Hamburg. Our headquarters is in San Francisco. So we do have um, a lot more locations in the US as well. Um, Yelp is a pretty big company. So we have over 5,000 people worldwide. And we have more than 500 engineers now. It's hard to keep track. And um, at the same time, we own more than 300 microservices. So it's like a pretty big scale company with a lot of interesting problems to solve. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about refactoring. And this is the agenda for today. So I'm going to talk about the what's, the why's, and what kind of things we can refactor, talk a little bit more about code smell and the ways to deal about um, these code smells, and also, in the end, the role of testing and refactoring. So let's jump right into it. What is refactoring? Um, according to Martin Fowler, um, he's this very important guy who wrote the book called Refactoring, so I guess we need to look at what he says about this. Um, he says that refactoring is a controlled technique for improving the design of an existing code base. I think what we need to pay attention to is that refactoring is basically changing the design of your programming without changing the functionality or the behavior. So that part we need to keep in mind. So why is this so important? Why do we need to spend time doing this, uh, doing this right? Like, and we're spending time talking about this. First of all, it cleans up your tech debt problem. So let's talk a little bit about tech debt and how they're being created, right? So I can just imagine as engineers, we have um, pressure from the product side, right? We need to deliver fast sometimes. And we might not have time to think through the solutions. And uh, this is how you create tech debt, right? Or you have a good solution, but then new requirements come in. So in the end, the code uh, is a little bit like not great anymore. So in this case, refactoring really helped clean that up. At the same time, I also want to point out it really saves productivity now. So imagine you're working with a legacy code base with really hard to read code. So you read it one time, and then you like go to bed, and then next morning you come in, and you have to read it again, and you don't remember, because the naming was bad, and then like it has a lot of weird functions going on. So what we do for refactoring is that we've give that one-time effort, right? And then you don't have to look at these bad namings or bad code anymore. And it also saves your peers some time so that they don't have to suffer the way you did. And what is more is it increases your productivity. So looking into the future, you know, first of all, you don't have to look at the bad code. And now you can maintain better code that you um, probably it's better than before, I hope. And um, one thing I would want to point out as well, like I did mention that you know tech debt and stuff, um, but then I think refactoring is just a good practice that everything uh, everybody should adopt. Um, especially, I think that it's very hard to get get things right the first time, and like nobody get things right the first time. So refactoring is a good process that we go through so that um, we increase this productivity in the future. And what to refactor? I think there is a big hint on the screen. Your code smells. So code smell, it's something that we should take care of. And I want to talk a little bit more about this, what code smell is. Um, this is a really good term, um, just to get started with. 
Um, it says that uh, uh, the same important guy, Martin Fowler, mentioned that it's a service indication that usually corresponds to a deeper problem in a system. And note the word symptom. So it's, you know, like, it, like it's symptoms of problematic code design. And note the word symptom because sometimes it's just an indication of a bigger problem. It might not be a problem. So one example is cheese, right? Some cheese just smells really terrible, but it's actually good cheese. So the thing about code smell is you really need to dig into um, the code itself to see if it actually has a problem. But this can very well be an indication that there is a problem with the design. Um, some people also call it anti-pattern. So I grouped them um, into several categories so we can go through them logically. Um, let's just dive in. So unnecessarily long and complex code. Um, sometimes we write um, functions, classes that became really long and large, and it's, it can be categorized as like a god object, which means that now your function and classes just handles everything. Um, so I think it's very important for your classes and functions to have one responsibility. Otherwise, things just kind of um, get out of hand and it's very hard to maintain. Um, one of the things that can show that it's a god object is also long parameter lists. So if your function takes in like 10, 20 things, then you have a reason to worry about what's going on there. Um, another thing that happens pretty commonly um, is conditional complexity. So let me explain that a little bit more, uh, which uh, it pretty much means that if you have a lot of if-else statements and it's nested for more than three layers, then it probably means that there is a problem as well, or maybe not, but this is something that you should look into. Usually three times, uh, three layers is a little bit more. Um, Over-reliant on dictionaries as params. So you pass in params into your function, right? And one of the param is of a dictionary type, and oftentimes that can be a problem because you cannot really examine or look at the fields from outside. And in a lot of ways, when you delve into the function itself, you don't know the context, it's very easy to make a mistake there. Um, useless code. Um, the first point that I want to mention is dead code. Um, that just means that logically, there is no way that your code can actually get through that line. That means it's useless, um, so that you should definitely take out. Um, another thing is duplicated code. So if you repeat things for more than two times, you probably want to think about, should I extract that to a function? Should I extract that to a class? Um, things like that. And the third point is lazy class. So what does that mean? It means that a class has a few uh, attributes, but not really function. So the class doesn't really do much. And in this sense, you might want to convert that into a named tuple or something like that. Um, and then too many comments. So that is also um, a problem uh, because you introduce the comment to explain the code, right? But if the code is not simple enough to be self-explanatory, I think that we can do better on this. Coupled code, so very hard to separate. Um, the first point I want to mention is message chains. That means your um, function A probably takes function B as a parameter, and then function B takes uh, function C as a parameter, and so on, right? And in this case, the problem is if you change any of the function in this chain, right, you'll have to change all the other ones. And imagine you call it like a few times, and you know, changing one place can actually mean changing a lot of places, which is not great. Another thing is uh, indecent exposure. So as the name suggests, it just means that exposing your privates. And that is not great. So like imagine you have a class, right? And you have a lot of uh, internal methods that is just commonly called by other classes. Um, you probably want to merge those classes into one. Um, inappropriate naming, as I mentioned, it's a pretty hard problem. So like people say that there are three problems with, um, uh, three hard problems in computer science, right? There is threading, there is cache invalidation, and there is naming. So I'm glad we get to talk about one today. Um, it's actually more important than um, I, before I used to think. So one thing I want to mention is variable and function naming. So you can really get into the situation of having inconsistent naming. So imagine you're working on an application where you name your graph a chart somewhere, plot somewhere, graph somewhere. You can imagine like that is very error prone, and that's how bugs are being created. 
at the same time, uncommunicative naming. So that means your variable name doesn't really encapture what your variable actually means and what, what it actually does. Type embedded means, uh, type embedded names. Um, say you have a, a date and then you put like um, the name as date string or something like that, um, which is not great really. So like, you know, you can use type annotation. It's available now, Python 3.6, it's the way to go. Um, at the same time, inappropriate module structure and naming. So imagine you're uh, importing something that calls from Yelp core component, businesses, business, import, get business. That's very, very informative. And it's really not great to use. So let's go through some example to really see these theories in practice. And yeah, I call that developing your code nose because you gotta smell out those code smells. So I'm gonna stay here a little bit for you to read through the code. Um, so it's a simple example that demonstrates um, a few of the code smells. So if we go, go, through, um, go through it together, it basically covers five cases, right? Good mood and hungry, good mood and not hungry, bad mood and hungry, bad mood and not hungry, and then money equals, equals zero. So in this case, um, can you spot any problems that we talked about before? Feel free to raise your hands if you have any answers. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, that's definitely one of the problems that we can talk about. So let's jump into the points. Uncommunicative naming that we just mentioned. So as you see, we have mood, hunger, and money. And we have if mood bigger than three. But like, this is not a very indicative thing, right? If you think about it. Um, mood equals to three, is, does it mean that it's happy, it's sad? Like, there is no direction about it. So it's not very communicative. And that's why we added more comments. And that's the second problem, right? If your code, like, you know, this is not very um, complicated logic here. If your code has, um, I don't know, like 20 lines here and you have to add so many comments to explain it, it probably means that there is something wrong with the naming. At the same time, as you said, right, we have duplicated code here. We can totally extract if money equals equals zero, return none um, to elsewhere, extract it together because it's not really related to mood bigger than three if else. And this is uh, another problem that I mentioned before. It's called conditional complexity. As you can see here, we have five clauses, but then somehow in the else statement, we have more than three nested um, conditionals here, which I think we can definitely simplify to make the code more readable. Okay, going forward to the next slide. So this is the second iteration of refactoring. So let's see if the code is perfect or not yet. So we have the evaluate function. Now gives the um, variable a better naming in a way. So we have um, the direction now is happy, mood bigger than three, um, things like that. And now we have get cheese that is much more flattened than the nested solution before. Right, so now we have five clauses. And there is one thing I want to mention here. Um, so the first four are actually called the guard clauses. The last one is the normal case. So the first four just means that it's an abnormal situation. So you, you put forward all these clauses first before you put forward the normal solution. So in this case, the normal case is return blue. And that's is happy and is hungry. Okay. So uh, one thing to note as well, we're calling, calling get cheese and then calling evaluate as a parameter. So one problem here, uh, a could be problem, is that we change the input params. Imagine that um, your function is actually used everywhere in the code base. Um, that might introduce a problem because you have to change the way people call your function, right? So if it's not encapsulated within your application, so and if people are directly calling this function, that could introduce some complications. And at the same time, since get cheese now 
um, is now tightly coupled with evaluate, we might come into the situation of a message chain where one function relies on another one. Um, you can also argue that, hey, what if I use evaluate elsewhere as well, right? And that's kind of like extracting the duplicated code. Sure, like in that case, you know, maybe we can go with that solution. But if evaluate is only used in one case, then this might be a problem. This might be message chain. So going forward, one slide. Does this look better to us? Now we even have a nice doc string that tells us what this function does, evaluate criteria uh, and pick cheese. We have the better naming. We have um, the flat, uh, flattened um, conditionals. And we're just calling get cheese. We didn't change the function functionality, nor the way you call it. So I would say for now, it looks great. <laughs> Next slide. So just some more nitpicking to get it better. Um, right now, we're calling um, cheese and then get cheese, right? Maybe one thing that can be better is like chosen cheese equals get cheese something so that we pinpoint even more the context. And even better, you can uh, give naming hints, uh, the parameter, uh, parameter naming hints um, to this function. So like you can, when, you, when you call it, you can specify that mood equals three, hunger equals five, money equals one. And that's useful because I can imagine as a developer, you have like five terminals, windows open, and then you, can, you don't have to refer back and forth to the definition of the function. So you immediately know this is exactly what I'm calling, which is great. And the best way is um, chosen cheese, get cheese, and then you use the vertical alignment um, in this case. Um, usually, that's the PEP8 standard. If you have more than 79 characters, you want to um, uh, use the vertical alignment. And that's great because um, it can potentially avoid git, git merge conflicts. Um, that means if you add a parameter, you'll only change one line and not the entire parameter line. And that's also another argument for trailing comma for the uh, trailing comma for the third um, param money equals one. Uh, that means if you add another parameter, the only line that gets changed is the parameter that you got added, and not money equals one. So that also provides more clar uh, clarity. So some other guidelines we can follow whenever we're designing um, Python programs. The son of Python, so if in doubt, import this. The son of Python is not only a beautiful piece of poetry that you can look at, um, it also contains a lot of philosophy of what you should do when you design a Python program. I think we have covered several of the, um, the lines there, including simple is better than complex, flat is better than nested, and readability counts. But they have other tips as well on how to write a good program. Um, PEP8 that I just mentioned, so tackling readability and consistency. So PEP8 really brings together like a, a style guide of how we should write Python. So these are some of the suggestions that they have. Um, people who use tabs for Python, I'm sorry to break it out to you. Uh, spaces is the way to go. Um, at the same time, line breaks, indentation styles, uh, white, space, uh, white space, we'll also go through in the next example. Um, another thing I want to mention is the good replacement for dictionaries as params. Um, so here we choose name tuples. As I mentioned, if you put dictionary as one of the parameters, it's oftentimes hard to tell what fields are in it. So it's extra develop, uh, developer time to try to have to inspect the code and look through what are the types of these fields and the name of these fields. So named tuple is a better way to go because you can immediately see the definition and you can see the structure. And at the same time, it's immutable, so it's safer. And also, fields are ordered if you want that function as well. And as of Python 3.6, we support default values in um, named tuples already. So that's great. So to better illustrate my point, let's go through another example. So about PEP8, having consistent indentation levels so here, I would see there are problems with chosen cheese one and two. The first one, it has a redundant trailing comma. 
the second one, um, it has excessive white space between um, in the assignment operator. And at the same time, the indentation is wrong because if you pick vertical alignment, which means putting parameters um, one line over uh, after each other, you cannot have horizontal alignment at the same time. So the third one will be the way to go. And since we're talking about trailing commas already, I just want to go through um, a very e easy mistake to make in Python. So be really careful with trailing commas because for hunger level one equals hunger, um, that actually created a tuple for you. Um, so it's pretty much equal to hunger level two, where Python interpret that as a tuple with only one item in it. And that's a pretty common bug, unfortunately. So I, I'm pretty sure you wanted to do hunger level three equals hunger instead. Um, so you're like, oh no, like there are so many things I need to take care of when I write code, which, you know, don't fret, there are actually programs that can help you do that. So you can just go ahead and install the PEP8 package or Flake8, which is pretty much, I think, PyFlakes combined with PEP8. And here, if you run your program, cheese.python, it'll tell you on which line there is a problem. So you can just go ahead and fix that, not having to worry too much. And for some reason, if you want to bypass that check, you can also put a new QA there. And so the, um, the PEP8 package will skip through that line. But you shouldn't, you really have, there is no reason you should do that. <laughs> um, example three, let's go through um, some of the tips of using good data structures. Um, so imagine I got a ticket that I need to fix this function because there is something wrong with it. So okay, I go into the code, I look at this. Oh, there is a nice doc string that tells me, hey, there is a param called location. And now like, I look at the type and it's dictionary, so I cry a little bit inside because now I need to do the inspection. And then I'm thinking, like immediately thinking that could it be this format, the other format, or it can even be like a nested dictionary and that gets me a little bit upset. And so, um, instead of doing that, right, we can really go through the, uh, go to the named tuple solution. So I provided two examples, one in Python 2 and another in Python 3.6. Um, that is the new syntax that you, you can even use class that inherits from named tuple. And in here, the best part of it is um, it can give you even type annotation, which means you don't have to play any guessing games. I look at this, I know exactly what, this, uh, what the input will be. And that looks pretty good. Um, last but not least, I want to go through the role of testing in your refactoring flow. So this is usually how I approach refactoring, like the steps that I go through. Um, the first one is writing integration tests for legacy code if it's not present already. Second step is doing the refactoring and running your integration tests uh, along with. And third is writing unit tests for your refactored code. So let me just um, explain that for a little bit more. Um, as I said, right, refactoring is the process do you change the design of your program to be better, but then it's not changing the behavior of the code, right? So writing the integration tests makes sure that the, uh, the behavior of your code doesn't really change during the refactoring, right? So like, no matter what changes inside the black box of your application, the behavior of it shouldn't change. But then unit test is a different concept, right? You're testing in the, uh, individual functions that you write to see that um, if the function is doing the right thing. So that will write in the end because that's when you finalize your implementation of the refactoring. So yeah, this is the difference between uh, first step and third step. So I would also want to provide an example for us to see how an integration test look like and a unit test look like. So in this case, an integration test might be uh, test get cheese with proper query. So we get the URI, and then we assert that there is no respond error. And at the same time, asserting that, hey, we have the message that said you got the right cheese. So it looks like your application is functioning normal. So that's what um, the flavor of the integration test is sort of like. And for unit tests, right, as I mentioned that we're writing the function called classify cheese, so here, let's give it some fake inputs, location, price, and production year. And then we assert that it's equal to Brie. So that's really testing that your individual function is correct. 
So just to recap what we talked about today, we talked about what is refactoring, um, the whys, and also what to refactor. Um, talked a little bit about how to identify the code smells and how to fix them. And at the same time, we talked about um, the importance of testing in refactoring. And last but not least, we are hiring. Um, yeah, we're hiring a lot of people in Europe, so drop by our booth, come talk to our engineers. We're really interested to have you work with us. And this is how you can reach us as well. I personally think that the engineering block is pretty interesting. Um, you know, stay tuned. And happy refactoring. Any questions for me? So oh, after this cheesy presentation, <laughs> uh, have you got any questions for Yeni? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you uh, convince project leads and so on to spend money on refactoring and time? So how do you, <laughs> what's the ratio or, uh, I mean, they always want to evaluate Mm -hmm. um, I think it really depends, um, yeah, like that's a really hard question to answer, but personally, um, imagine you're working on a project that involves a lot of legacy code, right? Then you have to give your project manager a realistic expectation of, hey, working on the legacy code actually takes more time, right? And in that case, you have to adjust your project timeline to fit the need. And in this case, you can tell her that, hey, but if we spend one week of refactoring time, we can save him maybe like two weeks in the whole development process. And so I feel like that's usually um, one of the cons convincing tool to tell your product manager because they really care about deadlines. Okay, any more questions? Thank you for the talk, uh, amazing. Um, how do you feel about letting the, um, all the, the code standards and stuff uh, handled by automatic tools instead of just saying, hey, everybody needs to care about that? Uh, I know there's a few around. Do, do, you think it's still import uh, do you think it's important to have a culture of, yeah, everybody needs to write it like this, or maybe we can just outsource that to computers that does it automatically? Um, I think that can obviously be one of the solutions, but I guess the talk wanted to point out that refactoring is important and everybody should have the mindset to keep the code cleaner and simpler. So while like, I don't have any objections to that, I feel like it's important for people to know exactly how they can do it themselves for, uh, first uh, before we rely on other solutions that programmatically does the work. And so like as an example, right, like the Pep8 things, I spent some time talking about um, what are the good style, uh, style guides to follow and explain why we need to do that instead of just, hey, like why don't we just import Pep8 to fix everything in the first run, right? Right, there's another question. Uh, maybe a, not a question, but a remark. Um, you mentioned uh, named tuples for grouping um, attributes. Um, I wouldn't use that probably in cases where the order doesn't matter. And I was, uh, wanted to mention that as an alternative. Uh, I think since Python 3.4 or 3.5, uh, type simple namespace. Yeah, we, we just assign attributes uh, if, you, if you want to express that the order doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure, thank you. Right, yep. Yeah. Start up. Uh, thank you for your talk. Just wanted to ask, uh, how do you feel about uh, making exceptions to some of the uh, restrictions made in PEP8? In particular, my favorite one is the line length. <laughs> do you ever make exceptions or is... Um, yes. Sometimes I would say, especially um, in templating languages where um, the split of lines is not as clean as in just Python, sometimes I do skip the lines, unfortunately. Um, that's why I showed the no QA thing, but um, I think if you're just writing normal Python, you know, like, it's better to stick to the rules. <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> Any more opinions or questions? Huh. Right. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I mean, it was really interesting, and I'm just wondering how do you feel about um, that sort of package like AutoPep 8, where you just say, okay, AutoPep 8, you put it like different kind of aggressive flags that it automatically nicely formats your code. So I would assume doing it manually, you more have the control, you know what's going on. Um, but I don't know if you have some experience to show about that. Um, yeah, I think, as I said, I think it's a good practice just so you realize what kind of things they change, right? Because I think it's important to understand the reason we're doing this. But as I said, like, feel free to use any packages or things that can help with your workflow. Right, we still have time, but if you want to beat the queues for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't see any more hands, so let's uh, clap once again for you. <laughs>